Welcome back to the Banking on Digital Growth podcast. My name is James Arbert Lay, founder and CEO of the Digital Growth Institute, where we are on a mission to help financial brands stop losing loans and deposits. Today's episode is part of the Practical Perspective series, and we're going to peel back the curtain and share some of the key insights that we've recently gained from a website secret shopping study that we facilitated for a financial brand. But before we get into today's discussion, before we get into today's conversation, if you are on a marketing sales or leadership team at a bank, at a credit union, at a fintech, I want to invite you to join over 300 other growth-minded leaders in the banking on digital growth community who are all committed to learning, committed to growing, committed to connecting together. You can become a member in less than 60 seconds when you visit www.digitalgrowth.com forward slash membership. Now, Joining me for today's conversation is Audrey Canada, operations lead here at the Digital Growth Institute. And I'm looking forward to our conversation, Audrey, because we're talking website secret shopping, practical yes. findings, almost real time findings. Very based much up, so. Based upon a study that you recently facilitated. Before we get into that, that that discussion, that conversation, what what is good for you right now, personally or professionally, to start on a positive note here? Yeah, so I'm uh, actually, I haven't even told you this yet. I'm geeking out a little bit right now. I just pre ordered yesterday Ryan Holiday's latest book. Yes. I'm a huge fan of his. We talked about the obstacles away, uh, discipline is destiny. And his uh, third book in the Stoic Virtue series is coming out soon called Right Thing Right Now. And it's it's really centered around justice. And, and that's something that I, I feel very passionately about is justice and doing the right thing. Um, and so, yeah, I'm super excited to get his latest book. Ryan, he's such a great writer and he takes ideas that are at this point a couple thousand years old and makes them feel in some cases brand new but I think more specifically, very practical and applicable in today's quote unquote age of AI that we're in. I mean, if you think about what you've what you've learned from from his writing, particularly with this series, what's been the big takeaway from the first one or two books? Ooh, that is that is a really tough question. I mean, I could go on and on um, about the takeaways. Um you know, I think one of the things that I appreciate the most about his writings is how it's, they're all so practical. Um, he really, it's, I mean, they're like guidebooks yes. um, and really kind of help you understand and navigate the different situations that you're in, in life, you know, um, you know, it addresses your, your physical well-being, your mental, your emotional relationships. And so it really just, it's so broad. Um, and I think it's one of those that really anybody, anybody can pick up this book. It doesn't matter what um, what field you're in, what industry you're in, whether you're looking for professional growth, personal growth. I mean, there really is something there for everyone. You know, that's a great point because it's the it's the practicality or the ability to apply what you're reading or what you're learning that creates the greatest value. And I think about writing banking on digital growth and now writing banking on change. I want to make sure that, yes, there is some philosophy or a foundational framework that the mind can build on because it's it's the mental models, if you will, that take a very complex idea and begin to put some structure around it. But we also need to be able to apply those mental models or those methodologies to create valuable, t tangible value out of thought and that's exactly what we've been doing with the website secret shopping studies and in this one particular instance i i want to just break down some almost real-time insights because we recently delivered the findings and the recommendations uh to this organization uh with their website optimization game plan context is important. That actually was something that came up, you know, in that discussion was the idea of, of context. It was something that they had referenced even with themselves. Why is context so important when we're thinking about website secret shopping studies? I think that context is important because it really helps you understand the specific um, 
journey that you're on. I mean, there are micro journeys we talk about within the website. Um, so many different areas that you can look at and study, but also really helps you get into the mind of your customer, mm. uh, their perspective. I think a lot of times we have these unconscious bias because of who we are, our experience, um, how well, you know, how familiar we are with our brand and our website. And it's easy to forget, you know, it's easy to forget that there are different perspectives out there. There are people with different experiences, um, you know, different amounts of knowledge who are coming to your site. And we need to understand that and really kind of get in their minds and their heads. And that is where the website secret shopping studies come into play, because not only are we able to get into their minds, but more deeply, I say we're able to get into their hearts, the feelings and the emotions that they're either yeah. a expressing through their verbal download of the website shopping experience or the competitive experience, the benchmarking, but also tonality. Uh, yeah, smooth. that's huge. And, and maybe what, because you, in, in this particular uh, website secret shopping study, you, we observed over a hundred minutes of quote unquote, what we call game film. Um, yes. What, what are you hearing? And it, cause, cause you can hear words, but you also can hear tonality and inflection, which is important yes. to you in on. And that's the thing. I am huge on watching every minute um, of, of the game film because there are so much to be learned from their tone of voice, from their pauses, uh, from some of their uh, um, like, you know, filler words, you know, if we were to just rip a transcript out and go off just their words or just their answers, you're not going to get the full picture. Um, you're not going to see the, or hear the frustration in their voice, or you won't see, you know, the time it takes for them to navigate through your site. A lot of that I think is major. It's almost like, what are they not saying? What are they not saying is a lot of that feeling that we get out of it. Um, and I can pick up a lot. I mean, you can hear in their tone of voice so much. Um, and so I think, yeah, it's really important to, to look at that. It's not so much what they say, but, but how are they saying it? We're going to go into philosophy here. Um, and we're going to stick, stick with Ryan holiday, uh, his perspective, uh, that I know that we're both fond of around stoicism. Mm -hmm. Marcus Aurelius wrote in meditations that you're reading that I'm rereading right now. Yes. Uh, and I would say reading at a more deeper level because I've, mm -hmm. I've skimmed the book. Like I do a lot of books. I skim the books, but this one is, yes. and maybe it's because um, I'm, I'm in an executive coaching program this year, uh, platinum elevated with Chad Willardson. And one of the things that he challenged, he said, instead of reading new books, go back and read maybe reread five books that have yes. impacted you. And so that's what I'm doing with meditations. And so I heard that recently too. <laughs> and it's, it's, I'm having a hard time with that. It, it's interesting because it's, it's as, as I'm going back through, I'm just seeing things from a different perspective and see that's, that's the idea of the website secret shopping study. Right. It's, it's giving you the ability to see things from a different point of view, different perspective. Perspective is the sum of context and framing. Mm -hmm. But if you think about what Marcus wrote about, he said, the universe is change. Our life is what our thoughts make of it. And as someone is navigating through a website shopping experience, they are going through a series of changes really at a, I would say a deeper subconscious level that they're not aware of. And that's one of the, the methodology to the frameworks that we use is the five stages of the emotive transformational journey. So contextually speaking, we have the awareness stage, the consideration stage, the purchase stage, the adoption stage, the advocacy stage, but then more to our unique perspective, what are the emotions that mm -hmm. are, that we need to transform through each one of those stages? Because regardless of the product that we're secret shopping, whether it is a deposit product, a loan product, a mortgage product, 
an SMB product, we know that the vast majority, i.e. 50 to 60% plus, enter into a buying journey with some type of negative emotion. Yeah, it's not fun. And actually, we should probably, we should probably, that, and, and we're just going to do some real-time optimization into our own methodology here. That should be something that we ask when someone yeah, starts to, in the frame of mind, question. the frame of mind, like imagine that you're shopping for a new checking account. How do you feel? How do you feel right now? Yeah. That's because, a great, that's a great point. I love it. And, and, well, that's why I enjoy these conversations because we're able to even help see I'm things. Writing it down right now. <laughs> well, I, I, I love this. We're able to see things from a different perspective. And I've never considered that before uh -huh, because we ask, yeah. we ask that question once they hit the website, specifically the homepage, based upon what you see, do you A, feel like you can trust this financial brand? B, how does what you see make you feel within like the first three seconds or so? But it's getting into the emotive mind state even pre-website yeah. visit. Yeah. Because that how do you feel right now question is specific to how do you feel about this brand, about this page, about what you're seeing, not how do you feel about opening up a checking account or applying for a loan in general. I imagine those two would be very different. Maybe maybe even a broader question, and, and I know that we've we've discussed this and we know the the emotive impact of money, but you're in the market for a checking account. How does money make you feel? How's your current financial situation? We've asked a question similar to we that have. a while back on stress, financial stress. Mm -hmm. But then starting to do some pattern matching around that. And the, and the, and the reason, the reason that my, my mind is going here is because if we think about the five emotive transformations that have, have to happen within the context of the buying journey, awareness, what are we looking to transform? We're looking to transform confusion into clarity because confusion if we don't transform that into clarity confusion will lead to conflict confusion will lead to chaos who says uh if you confuse you lose who is that donald miller donald miller story yeah. brand uh if you confuse yeah you lose. And so the very first thing that we're looking for in this website secret shopping experience is where is clarity entering into the narrative? How, what questions are we asking to surface that? So for example, in this particular experience, it was for a checking account. How did we, yeah. how did we identify based upon the responses of whether or not this particular financial brand was increasing clarity, which would then lead to an increased level of courage and commitment and confidence, or were they adding complexity and adding confusion? Yeah. So leading into those questions to get them again in that frame of mind as we ask them just in general, when you're shopping for a checking account, what are you looking for? What are the most important benefits, features that you're look, looking to get just to kind of surface that in their mind already as they're looking? Um, and then once they're on the page, we simply ask them, what is the most helpful thing on this page uh, for you to make you feel better about the decision that you are making to move forward? What's the most helpful? And on the flip side, we'll ask them, what information is missing? What information would make it easier for you to feel more confident uh, moving forward and opening an account with this institution? And then what is confusing? Uh, maybe something's there, mm. but it is, it does have a little bit of confusion around it. Maybe it's not completely, you know, spelled out the way they're looking for, lacking some detail. So those are the three different areas that that we'll look at. Well, I, I want to break down some of the findings here for those who are watching or listening, because what we've been able to do is identify common patterns now that we've facilitated over 1,200 of these studies over the last decade or so. Yep. And even now, if we go back over the last three years or so that you've been really facilitating some of these 
you're starting to see some pattern changes within responses within the marketplace. Yes. Before we get there, I want to come back to this contextual framework and, and, and finish this out for those who are watching or listening. So we're not leaving them hanging at the awareness stage. So we have awareness where we're looking to transform confusion into clarity. We have consideration where we're looking to transform clarity into courage. And what we mean by that is based upon what is presented visually on the page, communicated on the page. It's giving someone a sense of help. It's giving someone a sense of hope to continue forward and not mm -hmm. abandon the page, not go somewhere else. So there's a level of courage because as we move from awareness to consideration, then we're moving into purchase. Purchase is where we're looking to transform that courage into commitment. And what we mean by that is there's a level of commitment to when someone clicks the apply button. Mm -hmm. But commitment does not mean completion. Commitment does not even mean funding uh, mm -hmm. a loan or funding a deposit account for that matter. And that is where the adoption phase comes into play because that's where we're looking to transform commitment into confidence. And that's a whole conversation. It's almost like we could take each one of these stages and maybe, maybe we should, maybe we should take each one of yeah. these stages in the emotive transformations that have to happen because we, we go from the adoption stage to the final stage, which is the advocacy stage. And that is where there's an opportunity to transform confidence into community to when an account holder feels like there's that word again, feels like they are part of something bigger than themselves. And this is a very, I would say it's a, it's a newer idea for many financial brands to think, well, we are a community institution. Yeah. How are you bringing your account holders together to connect, to learn, to grow? Are you? And if you're not, that's a tremendous opportunity to be a community financial brand to facilitate not just community in the physical plane, but also in the digital plane to bring account holders together to connect, to learn, to grow even better together because we know how confusing, how stressful money is. And when people are on a similar journey, the probability for them to move forward and make progress together exponentially increases. It's like the old African proverb. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And so I'm really recommending financial brands look for opportunities to transform confidence. They're an account holder, transform that into community, ratings, reviews, referrals, coaching, even uh, content curriculum, yeah. uh, because that would then, then just repeat the process and shorten the buying journey for someone else. Because now you have influence not coming from marketing communication, but you have influence coming from the most trusted marketing channel on planet earth, even today's digital world, which is a rating review referral from a friend, family member, colleague, et cetera. So let's come back, dive deeper into this, this particular study here. And what were some of the insights that were shared that were gained? What are people looking for when they're shopping for a checking account? What do they need to see? What do they need to perceive? to increase their courage to commit to move forward with confidence? So this one was really interesting. And for this particular uh, institution that we were looking at, uh, the news, I mean, there was, there was good news in all of this because they actually had what these people were looking for. It was just a matter of reorganizing and restructuring the information, which is, you know, that's, that is not a problem. Um, but we had a lot of users really, really appreciate that they had multiple different types of checking accounts now and, and really listed the, the features for each of them. What was interesting, though, is this particular brand had two different pages with checking account information on it. They had one page that had it that had them all uh, listed out the, the accounts, the bullet points. 
Um, and they had another page that had an actual comparison chart. And we drove them to the page that just had the uh, five different accounts with bullet points uh, underneath each. And it was kind of up to them to you know cross reference and figure out which one worked best for them. And most of them mentioned, gosh, I wish they had a comparison chart here just to make it easier to figure out, you know, which benefits do I get across all of these accounts? Which ones separate them apart? It's almost like information overload at that point. Yeah. Um, you know, they appreciate having choice, different options, you know, more personal to them. But then it was like, okay, this is too much. And I don't even know where to go now. I, I don't know which where to move forward. And so, you know, the good news is they had a comparison chart. It just was tucked away. It was a few clicks away to get to. Mm. And so that was a really big, um, you know, a, a big point that was made. And also really explaining, I mean, this this uh, institution had a lot of really interesting benefits that I think you and I hadn't seen some of these before. Yes, they did, uh, actually. Uh, and Yes. But it was, the responses were, tell me more. And, yeah, this and, is great, but what is it? See that, and, and now you're looping back to this idea of, of perspective and belief because the perspective from the financial brand leadership team was those aren't that important. Like, I, I wouldn't yes. make it, I wouldn't make a buying decision because of that. And I paused them. I said, "Do you hear what's happening?" And they said, "Yeah, yeah, it's your bias." Your perspective. Your bias is showing. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and and don't trip over that uh, because right. what we do within the quote unquote, the vertical, because those who work within financial services will have a certain perspective versus those who do not work within the vertical and they have a different, we'll just say re overall relationship with money for that matter. So I said, but if you think about the idea of, of packaging up value, that's what they were doing with this, with these additional features and these benefits. I said, A, you have a commoditized product. It's a checking account. Right. And, and more specifically, it's it's really a spending account. Um, and I know that's a contentious subject of like, what do we call this thing? Uh, and and I'm, I'm saying, okay, checking for the short term, but in reality, this is a spending account. And and what are we, if we're thinking about jobs to be done, what are we encouraging people to do? We want people to spend with confidence. Mm -hmm. So that's an idea for positioning that we had recommended to them. Now, if we come back though, packaging up value, what they perceived as not very valuable was the potential to be very valuable if we were to highlight what these benefits were. And I said, in a commoditized world, you're seeing this with cell phone providers. So, for example, cell phone providers are packaging up additional value by offering a Netflix subscription or a uh, Amazon Prime subscription or a, uh, what's the other one, Spotify subscription. It's the same idea here. Um, I even I even just recently observed, Audrey, and this was super, I want to I get your take on this. It wasn't for this particular organization, but it was for a checking account. Okay. This this particular financial brand was packaging up a Fitbit oh. with those who open a new checking account. And I almost felt like we're going back to the 80s, like yeah. get a toaster and a checking account. But <laughs> for this particular organization, and I have been observing them now for the past few years, they continue to lean more heavily into we'll call it just financial wellness. Mm -hmm. So I thought what they were doing here, packaging up a Fitbit as a value add to opening a checking account. What's your take yeah. on that? That's interesting. And I think, you know, on the note of community and talking about building a community, well, that right there, you know, you're appealing to those who are, you know, into fitness, um, into health. That alone could be a whole community right there, you know, fitness, finances. Um, I mean, I, I'm very interested in that. I have to look at that later. Drop me the link. Well, uh, it, it would be interesting to see what they're doing with that. Right. 
Because the way it's positioned, it's open a new checking account and be eligible to receive a $300 bonus and keep your health in check with a complimentary Fitbit. From my limited working knowledge of Fitbit, because I'm a Garmin person. Yeah, I, I've never had one. I do believe that you can, and for example, with Garmin, like I'm connected with Eric Cook. Um, who's been a guest on the podcast and he's in the industry. And so we're able to share our workouts and see, I can see when he's biking, he can see when I'm running. And yes, and, and I 45 has something similar to that too. And I understand that people who are watching, listening, like I would never do that, but your bias is showing. Yeah. Be mindful. Um, well, a Fitbit isn't important to me. But if you go and maybe do the market research at the local market level, what could you identify that would be an additional value add right. that would allow you to, A, put the transformation of people over the commoditized transaction of dollars and cents, and B, really elevate the product to create even more value. And it's, it's perception, yeah. it's perceived value, I think. Yeah. I mean, you're just, you're tapping into another another area. And, and really, I mean, we talk about finances, you know, it is, it, it is part of so many different elements of your life. I know you talk about faith, fitness, finances, family. Um, they are so, you know, interwoven and finding a way to do that. Yes. Um, and we know, I mean, gosh, we, we talked, you know, so many times about the relationship between your, you know, physical fitness and your financial fitness. You know, it would be very interesting actually, if there was, and I'm curious to see what, what, how large is the F45 brand? Um, like how many, how many it's nationwide, it's, it's, nation, that. it's nationwide yes. and maybe we need to talk and, and across country. I mean, they're maybe, in every country, well, I mean, not but, every country, but they're, they're all over, but maybe we need to talk to Mark Wah Wahlberg about this. Um, yeah. because he's in, hot, he's in hot water right now. Yeah, it's true. But, <laughs> but. If you think about community, I know F45 has a huge community. It's kind of like the CrossFit community or Orange Theory. Mm -hmm. they, each one of these right. fitness brands has a built-in community. And I know that for a niche or neo financial brand, we only need about 10,000 account holders for profitability. I wonder if there's a there's a possible play for like a an F45 financial brand. Side point, but just Yeah, that is a that is a side point. Using the podcast for a co-creation opportunity. It is. Yeah, my so my and you know this but the the owner to my for my F45 is um a financial advisor. Yeah. Actually, and he was and so we've been talking on the side. He's kind of helping me out getting getting some investments rolling and um he he was recommending that I open an HSA account and pay my membership through that, um, which I thought was really interesting. And he's, I mean, he took it upon himself to kind of connect the two dots for me. But I mean, yeah, it, it's it's an investment. Um, but I can tell you what, it's my financial uh, health is better because of it. That's exactly right. Because there's that connection between fitness, financial yeah. fitness, and physical fitness. And mental fitness or financial well-being, mental well-being, physical well-being, they're all interwoven. We just went down a rabbit hole. I'm going to bring us back. Oh, we did. <laughs> I'm going to bring us back um, into some of the other findings here. I think one of the interesting ones, and, and, and this is, once again, it's about positioning. So a lot of this is really about positioning, which is perspective, mm -hmm. context, and framing. The importance of online and mobile banking when it comes yep. to checking accounts, what do we typically see when we secret shop these websites for financial brands, particularly on the checking product that's creating maybe some confusion and conflict? Yeah. And we see this a lot with our, with our community banks and, and our credit union specifically. Um, people will say, uh, is, is there mobile banking? Is, is there online banking? Um, like almost as if they're not quite sure, uh, because there is no real, you know, major mention of it on a lot of these websites. And it is, um, 
a minimum requirement for most of us right now to be able to access our banking, you know, online, mobile. Um, we have benchmarked these brands against other uh, fintechs who le- who are only mobile first, really. Um, you know, you go on those websites and they show you giant you know, mobile screen, cell phone with all the features. And this is what the app looks like. And this is what it can do. And people want to see that on their community bank, on their community, you know, credit unions page. Like, let me know that I have a place to go and also give me a preview of what it looks like. Mm. What what, what do you think is driving those expectations? For mobile and online banking? Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's, it's the time that we're in right now. Um, it's the, it's the expectation that, that, and and once you, once you already have it, um, like for me, why would I move my, first of all, moving my account, checking account is going to be pain in the butt regardless. And I'm certainly not going to move it somewhere that doesn't have the same level of, you know, features and benefits. That's a good point. And so if, if you're saying, Hey, come open an account with us, but we're not going to show you what the online banking or the mobile banking experience looks like that could be, it could increase the potential for confusion and for conflict yeah. and for complacency. And what I mean by complacency is that there's not going to be a decision that is made. And so the opportunity, once again, it's to bring the mobile experience and integrate it within the checking page, within the checking yeah. positioning. Yes, I, awareness I, generates confidence. They're with it. They're with the times. We hear that a lot. Well, consider the fact, too, that you know when we look at the 2023 data coming out of Cornerstone Advisors, 47% of checking accounts that were opened in 2023 first half of 2023 came from digital slash fintech. And now that's not to say that the physical world or the human element is not important. That's a big shift that I would say that we're seeing, particularly with maybe a millennial and Gen Z demographic. And that came out in the study here. It certainly did. Um, When we were doing the comparisons originally and these users were comparing and and contrasting the the community brand, financial brand with the fintech. And they would they would, you know, say, look, this fintech clearly is more modern, more up to date, looks a little bit easier to use, cleaner. Um, Now, on the flip side, yes, we do like this, you know, all the features and the um you know, the, the care and the personalization that we're getting from this financial brand. But when they, when it was, uh, came time to make a decision on let's go with a FinTech or let's go with this community, uh, bank, they chose the community bank because of having someone they could talk to on the phone, having someone they could contact, having a physical brick and mortar that they could go into and saying this FinTech I am concerned that there would be no one to help me if I needed something. I feel like it's just, um, it's a one size fits all. And I don't feel as confident there. And that is completely different than what we were seeing just one, two years ago. I wonder how, well. well and, and maybe, maybe post 2020, you know, we all kind of had, we uh, dipped our toes in this, this, um, Gosh, everything, all the, all this new and ease technology was exciting and it was new and it felt good, but maybe practically speaking, we've, we've used it for a couple of years now. We've run into roadblocks. We've had issues. We've had problems realizing, oh gosh, I can't help. I can't get help. I know Amazon is like this. Try calling Amazon customer service. Um, but you're, tra- that's the trade-off, you sure. know, you know, kind of going into it, I'm going to have to figure it out. There's no one I can call and talk to. Maybe our experience over the last few years is making us more aware that we actually do kind of appreciate that. You know, you're, you're, you're talking to kind of what's going on in the, the, the larger zeitgeist and it's a pendulum swing. 
2020 yeah. was a forced pendulum swing to really almost for lack of a better word pure play or highly highly digital highly highly mobile first experiences across the yeah. board across the world across the verticals I'm predicting as we're moving further into the age of AI, we're going to see the pendulum swing back the other way. It's not that we're going to be like completely anti digital or go off the grid, be a ludite, but people, especially in complex buying situations like financial services, the human touch is not going away. And I think people are going to lean more into that. And that was one of the, the recommendations that we made, made for them and it got a little bit of pushback. I said, you know, we have a uh, callback request system that we have integrated at other financial brands mm-hmm. that has gone on and we have the benchmark number. So for example, request a callback. That is a transitional call to action that is really in that consideration stage of the buying journey. So for those yeah. who, if we come back, you, you know, Awareness, transform, confusion into clarity. Consideration, transform, clarity into courage. Okay, they need a little bit more courage. Well, how do you, we People get the, love that? We got to, I need someone to call me back. I need to talk to someone. And when we ran the numbers for this particular institution using our benchmarks, we identified there was like $2.2 million in potential wow. lifetime value creation in the pipeline that could be yeah. in the pipeline. And the question was for them, what if contact, has there been pushback at other organizations with contact centers? And <laughs> to be very honest, it's, it's a contentious point and it's yep. one that I'm not backing away from because it's what people want. It is. If people have a question, Connecting with another human being as quickly as possible. This isn't my idea. I mean, this is coming from people who are way smarter than me over at Google that study this stuff at a much more macro level. But they, even within financial services, Google has found that connecting a human being with another human being is the most influential port, port point in a person's buying journey for a financial product. So why, why would we increase friction and only provide them with an, an apply button? And if they need to talk to someone, they got to go you know, search how to get to the contact yeah. page and they get to the yeah, contact page and it, it is all of, and, and you're like, Oh, it's not that big of a deal. James Robert. One of the things I wrote about in banking on digital growth is the idea of cognitive load. Yeah. Any small increase in cognitive load has a detrimental effect on conversion rate something that'll learn a strategic coach three words to simplify to multiply three words yeah simplify to multiply I had to do my math a lot of syllables simplify to multiply yeah. fine reduce the friction put us put a transitional cta right next to your apply or open an account cta i guarantee you beyond a shadow of a doubt you'll begin to increase your digital leads now that opens up new opportunities because now you have a marketing and sales or marketing and contact center collaboration, uh, but we should not let our own bias get in the way of the potential for future growth that comes by just simply helping people. Yep. As, as we start to wrap up here, thinking about this particular website secret shopping study, What's a recommendation for those who are watching or listening to take some of what we learned through this experience that they could take a small micro action back at their organization to move forward and make progress on their own journey of growth? I would say uh, one of the big recommendations that we made here, and and this, you know, it, it might sound like a lot, but um, I don't, I think it's it's worth it. But if you've got multiple checking accounts. For example, this one had five. Break those up on five different pages. Um, Mm. You know, have your, have your checking landing page where you have your overview of each account and maybe like the highlight of what sets it apart. 
but then have a you know click to learn more where you bring that person to a full page just dedicated to that checking account where you do spell out all of the features and the benefits very clearly. Um, I think trying to cram that all on one page, like you said, cognitive overload, mm -hmm. friction, confusion. Oh my gosh, it's too much. You know, paradox of choice. I yep. don't want to deal with this anymore. I'm I'm bouncing. I'm going to add to that thought if you don't mind. Sure. Guided selling, not only Absolutely. having all of the products, kind of a, a general landing page. And if someone wants to learn more, dive deeper instead of the bullet points, turn those into icons. Visual yep. processing is faster than reading uh, the written word. But also if you have, and I'll say, if you have more than two products, so if you have three, if you have four, if you have five, in this particular case, we found that this organization actually they had some conflict because they had six products in a table, but then they actually had five products on their individual pages. Right. And they actually spoke to that. They said, we had no idea. Like, we've been given these requests over time. And it's almost what happens is when a business line gives the marketing or the digital team request to add this to the website and add that to the website. It is like Frankenstein's monster. Yeah. You know? Oh my gosh. It's a great analogy. And <laughs> what what has to happen is we have to reach a point where we just pause and say, you know what? Let's take a first principles approach to this. What if we were to start over? Not build a new website, but what if we were just to reimagine this experience here? Yeah. Yeah. And who I mean, and all, and this might this might poke on some people or hit people the wrong way, but who's the expert here? You know, this is marketing um, website. I think a lot of times they just, they take orders from other business lines when it's not, it's not the best route to take. I'm even going to, I'm even going to push on that a little bit. All right. Who's the expert and it's not marketing and it's not the business line. The expert is the market. Yeah. The expert are the people in the market. They have a voice. They have perspective. They have questions, they have concerns, they have hopes, they have dreams. They're going to tell you. And that's what the website secret shopping studies do. They will there tell you. There we go, you. full circle. They will tell you what is missing. They will tell yep. you what is increasing their clarity or what is increasing their confusion. Yep. And all we have to do is just simply go all in. Ask good questions, listen, learn, and we'll grow even better together. Audrey, this has been such a great conversation here. Thanks again for joining me for, for another podcast. Absolutely. It was fun. As always, and until next time, be well, do good, be the light.